Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar for 2018. Uh, my name is David Brown and I work with the webinar coordinators, Home Sackett. Tonight's webinar is titled Sheep Meat Eating Quality, Does It Matter? It is a Meat Standards Australia update and it's to be presented by Professor David, Dave Pethick of Murdoch University. Uh, this is the recommencement of a 11-part, uh, a 24-part webinar series. Uh, this is the 12th webinar of that series, and we'll be taking it through to uh, June uh, in 2000, this year, 2018. So keep an eye on your emails and your text messages for upcoming webinars. We'll be having another webinar next week, uh, which will be dealing with prime lamb benchmarks. You know, that'll be delivered by Home Sackett. So keep an eye on your uh, on your inbox and we'll uh, update you as we go. Just a, uh, a quick look at, uh, excuse me, uh, just a quick look at the webinar platform for those who are joining us for the first time this evening. You're going to see this control panel on the top right hand side of your screen and uh, the red arrow button will collapse that control panel so it doesn't cover up the presentation this evening. Uh, you'll be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. That questions box is an important part of this evening's webinar. That's where you can let us know if there's any serious problems with the webinar audio or visual. Uh, you can let me know via that questions box. Um, or if you've got questions, uh, Dave has kindly offered to stay online for as long as we need after webinar this evening to answer any questions of the audience. Um, so as your questions come to mind, pop them in the questions box and we'll answer them in chronological order at the end of the webinar. So David Pethick is our presenter this evening. Uh, David grew up on uh, a family farm in South Australia, and which is now run by his brother. He trained in agricultural sciences at Adelaide University and then he completed his doctorate at the Cambridge University in the UK. He has worked in the farm animal industries for 36 years now and as a university academic, researcher, teacher and industry practitioner. David's currently involved in meat science of sheep and cattle across the value chain and he has played a key role in the development of the world-renowned Meat Standards Australia beef and lamb grading systems. I can assure the audience this evening that there's no one better place to talk to us this evening on uh, sheep meat eating quality and uh, whether it uh, and, and the different factors we need to consider within the industry than Professor Dave Pethick. So with that, I'd like to introduce David to the webinar and let him take it from there. Are you there, David? I am. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Hopefully you can hear me and, and so can the audience. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm on the uh, agenda page and I'll be controlling the, uh, the slideshow. So um, uh, we'll just briefly go through what I'd like to talk about. Um, and essentially, uh, the first question is, how does lamb eating quality stack up against competing meats? And I'll also have a little bit about sort of world, world meat consumption. Then we'll have an overview of uh, the Meat Standards Australia uh, lamb eating quality system, uh, obviously with a, a producer hat on. There are key producer uh, requirements and of course uh, there are also key, um, key requirements from the processor and retailer which we won't uh, dwell, on, dwell upon. Then I'd like to talk about the role of intramuscular fat which is uh, I guess in beef called marbling. Uh, also lean meat yield, by lean meat yield I mean the amount of meat in the carcass as a percent and then finally some new trends in carcass grading. And then I've been asked to give an update on the MSA uh, system, how's it progressing uh, and, and the industry uptake. So we will kick off with the, with the next slide, if I can um, make this thing work, uh, there we go. So how does uh, lamb stack up against other meats is, is the first question. So it's not that easy, but this is uh, some nice work from uh, the MLA uh, domestic consumer tracker work and they call it lamb imagery, and so consumer responses. So these are grocery buyers uh, coming out of supermarkets, 18 to 64 years of old, and the work's done over five capital cities. I think there's close to 2,000 respondents in this. So they're all asked the question. The first question was, 
there's a whole lot more questions. I just chose some. Uh, so is beef, lamb, pork, chicken, uh, is well liked by your household? And it's the number of response, respondents agreeing with that, uh, with that phrase, if you like it. And then I've shown one, two, three, four, five, six, eight phrases. Now you notice for the first seven, is it well liked in your household? Is something, lamb is something I'm confident to cook and prepare. Lamb is consistently of high quality. Uh, lamb is an important part of a healthy, balanced lifestyle. Lamb makes healthy meals, and lamb is suitable for everyday meals. We tend to fall into a, a somewhat lower category, not not shockingly low. Uh, obviously, pork's the lowest, and unfortunately, uh, well, I always say with tongue in cheek that chicken tends to be the highest, uh, and and beef tends to just just push out lamb. But there is an important last uh, box there: was it's perfect for special occasions, and lamb is actually quite a hands down winner. So the, the, the general conclusion with the MLA experts and others is that lamb you know, tends to trail a little bit uh, beef, more so chicken, in that generic uh, sort of consumer uh, feedback. However, it's clearly a special occasion favourite. This has been quite a common, uh, consistent answer. So we think that's sort of associated with that lamb's actually performing quite well, but it's quite expensive. So that's why it's not uh, perceived to be like a, a general uh, main run meal. Uh, I think it's we're sitting on, we used to sit on about 0.9 sirs of lamb per person per week, just under one once a week. Of course, my family's uh, somewhat different to that. Hopefully your family's as well. Now the next uh, slide, just is just to give you a bit of a feel of the global meat consumption. So this is a plot from uh, FAO statistics. You can find this on the net and it's millions of tons corrected to carcass weight, except for the chicken number. And so uh, we have green at the bottom is beef and veal, basically beef, and we have pig meat in red, and we have uh, poultry meat uh, in yellow, and we have lamb, it's either dark blue or black. So lamb averages to be about 5% of the world's meat consumption. And that black wobbly line is actually the lamb consumption as a percent of, uh, of total meats. And you can see, uh, if anything, it's projected to just gently increase to come back up to 5%, it probably popped down closer to 4.5%. So it's a, it's, a, it's a small meat on a well basis. It's not going to feed the world, but importantly, uh, most people believe it's a, it's a, it has this glorified niche component to its consumption. Now, I won't dwell on the next slide, which is uh, meat consumption, and it's got a whole lot of countries. So I thought I'd include that because David uh, is more than welcome to send you the uh, the, 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 these slides um, uh, at some point after this talk. But you might be interested just to look at the land consumption in all those different countries. The key thing is that most countries are well below four kilos per head. Australia is a rare country to be something like up around eight kilos per head. So that means our domestic market actually in Australia is extremely important. As you know, something like about 50% of, of our lamb is eaten locally. So on average, most countries eat only a small amount of lamb, but you, you know, you look at the People's Republic of China, they eat three kilos per head, which is actually a jolly lot for, for, for any particular country, multiplied by, that, by the number of people, you've got a lot of consumption. Uh, the next one is the, I was asked to show just the trends in, in lamb consumption with time. Of course, it's a disturbing trend that lamb consumption, particularly between about 2000 and 2010-ish, drop considerably. Now, this is the case with beef and lamb around the world. So as red meats became more expensive, their consumption has dropped. I suppose the most encouraging thing is, considering the price of lamb, it's the most expensive meat per kilo of lean in the world, I guess, excepting uh, some types of seafood and perhaps the uh, very high uh, in Japanese black cattle. We've, we seem to be hovering on that eight kilos and seem to be holding our consumption given the price. So I think that's a very encouraging sign. You see there a gentle increase for China's predicted, and of course that would have massive ramifications for land markets given their population. All right, so that's just a bit of an introduction, general introduction to lamb and, and some of the some of the sort of uh, the simplicity aspects of the markets. Um, now we'll move on to MSA lamb. So MSA lamb and sheep meats are underpinned by what we call consumer sensory testing. So these are what we call uh, untrained consumers. So we, we go to clubs in, in um, particularly Sydney, RSL clubs, Melbourne. We've also run them in uh, Perth, run them in America, China, 
um, where uh, ordinary people uh, come along and eat lamb steaks or lamb roasts. Um, and we grade the meat into unsatisfactory, good every day, better than every day and premium. Or if you like, simplistically ungrade, good, better, best. Good, better, best sort of rolls off the tongue. It could be a bit like fail, pass credit distinction at school. So they grade the meat into these important categories. And the important thing about that grading is it relates directly to their willingness to pay. So those consumers at the same time, and this graph shows 5,843 Aussie consumers that have answered a willingness to pay sheet. And if we say that three star, which is a, um, a good every day or, or just, uh, just your past meat, if we call that 100% of units of currency, they'll buy the stuff that failed, but they'll only pay half the amount for it. If the stuff is a four star or better than every day, or say a credit, uh, they'll give you approximately 150% more money. And if it's five star or premium, they'll give you nearly 200%. So this is a fairly consistent uh, response that the willingness to pay does follow the, uh, the grades that the consumers give. So I think that adds strength to the work. Now this chart here, uh, it's got a lot of stuff on it. We're not going to go through it all, but it's the critical control points that control, if you like, lamb quality between conception on the farm to consumption on the plate. And on the right-hand side in blue are those what I call pre-slaughter factors that the producer will have control over. And on the left in green are the uh, post-slaughter factors that the processor and retail have more influence over. So we'll go through uh, some of the key aspects of um, pre-slaughter control. They will be sheep age, a little bit about finishing and growth path, intramuscular fat, a little bit on stress, uh, an introduction to carcass measures and a very brief mention of genetics, which will become more important uh, in the next five to 10 years. So the first of all is animal age. There's a lot of talk about animal age uh, in the industry by farmers. So what we've done, we've done many experiments. This is a more recent one. And this was done in Merino lamb and Merino uh, half brothers that I call yearlings. They were either two tooth, which of course is uh, a legal hog definition in Osme, or four, four tooth, which in Osme have to be called mutton. Um, and you'll notice, so we've compared Merino lamb versus two or four tooth half brothers. So it had the same size with different mums. So the age of the lamb was nearly a year old, which is typical for merino lamb. It takes, you know, it takes longer to finish. And the age for the yearlings was close to two years old. So there was a, you know, a distinct, uh, uh, roughly one year gap between the two of them. The shear forces, the tenderness, it was no significant difference in the loin. Carcass weight, the carcass weight of the lamb was 21 kilos. The carcass weight of the yearlings was quite good, 25.5. So that's a beautifully grown yearling carcass. The fatness was the same for both, the intramuscular fat was the same for both, and the lean meat yield was the same for both. So there's just the sort of the carcass grading attributes. The most important bit is the eating quality. Now the eating quality for the loin, and this is not atypical, was the same for the lamb versus what I call uh, the two four tooth, so the young mutton, the hogger or young mutton. For the leg muscle, the top side, they're definitely tougher. So the consumers gave a lower point or score uh, and the young mutton or yearlings are in red. This is pretty typical. Working muscle, the top side in the leg, has a lot of connective tissue, and that connective tissue gets harder with age. So the conclusion really has been for, for some time now is that, is that lamb is always ahead of hogget or, or, or young mutton, four tooth, especially in the leg cuts. And this is consistent for Australian, US, and Chinese consumers. However, hogget and yearling could make a perfectly acceptable product if we could get a supply chain uh, giving enough consistent supply of these products. So that's, uh, I hope, hopefully you'll find it interesting and encouraging for the perhaps future development of, of, of older animals that, that uh, may occur because of their wool producers or other, other reasons. The next one is the importance of finishing. So by finishing, I mean feeding animals right, right to the time they leave the farm. So there's actually no difference in our consumer scores between grass versus a balanced grain diet. By balanced grain diet, I mean, you know, protein, 
uh, roughage and grain in in in, uh, in a in a manner that the sheep aren't scouring and all those sorts of obvious uh, aspects. So the, the the animals must be finishing that is gaining weight, and I'll give you some metrics around that in the next few slides. And this makes sure you don't get a reduction in the juiciness and flavour, and it also makes sure you don't have the risk of high pH meat, which we'll talk about next. And the other generic uh, rule we put into the system is, particularly for carryover or non-sucker animals, non-sucker lambs, they must be at least 18 kilos hot carcass weight and have a fat score of two. So it just, it just guarantees a bit of finish in them. That's, that's, that's all that last step does. So the importance of finishing, the first reason why it's important to finish, uh, obviously you've got to finish them to get a, an appropriate carcass weight uh, and, and fat score for your processor, but the, the meat science reason also is because of this muscle glycogen and meat pH. So muscle sugar is muscle glycogen, and it's used as an energy store in the live animal and by you when you play cricket and footy and soccer and that sort of stuff. It's converted to lactic acid in the carcass post-slaughter, and that acid uh, buildup is actually a good thing, and ideally meat is quite acidic. And when, once it's uh, set or in, in uh, rigor mortis, the next day, if you like, it should have a pH of about 5.5, quite acidic. Your soils would not really be that low. This means you get good meat colour. You don't get dark cutting, which is the consumers don't like. You get consistent cooking time. Uh, high pH meat is quite difficult to have the same degree of doneness. It also reduces the chances of off flavours. This has worked out many years ago. And perhaps one of the most important things, it's very important for the keeping quality of chilled vacuum packed meat that's aged for 20, 30, 40 days. And of course that equals our most valuable market, chilled lamb to America. So um, if you have a, a high pH, you get the wrong bugs growing inside that vacuum pack. You can get odors and all sorts of things. And it's, it's, it's perhaps one of the more important reasons uh, to, to have this low pH. So pH is pretty simply controlled in some ways. Uh, nutrition, not surprisingly, fills that glucose or sugar bucket up. And it, when it's full, it's muscles about 2% sugar or 2% glycogen. But of course, all sorts of stresses can empty the bucket. Dogs mustering, you know, running them around, bad handling, layerage. Um, so it's a, it's a blend between nutrition and stress. Luckily, the bucket just needs to be half full at slaughter. So usually good handling and good nutrition combined together give us adequate uh, muscle glycogen and slaughter. The next reason to, for, the, for the finish is, the, is to procure or secure the level of intramuscular fat. So this intramuscular fat is important for eating quality, and I'll come back to this in a couple of slides time. Ideally, it should be about 5% or above to achieve high-end product, which is actually not too dissimilar to beef. The current average uh, intramuscular fat uh, in terminal cross uh, lambs is 4.2%. So just a wee bit under. So things that can alter the intramuscular fat, one of them is two weeks of weight loss. So the animals are chucked out onto some shock and feed, they won't eat it. You can reduce that level by one percentage unit. So let's say the average 4.2, you can reduce that down to 3.2, which would be a disaster for eating quality. One fat score, so the fat of the animal does increase the IMF a little bit by 0.2 of, a, of an IMF percent unit. And one kilo of hot carcass weight gives you about 0.04 units of IMF. So 10 kilos of carcass weight gives you 0.4 percentage units. So the heavier they are, the heavier they are, of course you get more IMF. That's what that's saying. Because the heavier they, are, heavier, heavier they are, the fatter they are. Now the important new area of work is, of course, that uh, uh, perhaps the most important regulator of intramuscular fat is genetics. So it's strongly heritable. The heritability is close to 0.5 which means that 50% of the variation in intramuscular fat is due to, due to uh, genetics. And we now have breeding values for terminal size, maternal size and merinos for intramuscular fat. So that's a sheep genetics topic uh, of, for another day. Now, just to, just to be sure, there's no sense in over conditioning animals right out to score five. So sure, intramuscular fat will keep going up, but score five, that score five fat score or greater than 25 mils is too fat. Just too much fat has to be trimmed, and it's very difficult to manage at the processor and retailer end. And the score five four quarter is very hard to sell, and it's usually heavily discounted and sold at a loss. 
And just so you know, a score five lamb, the carcass will be somewhere between 30 and 40% fat. So the carcass will be somewhere between 30 and 40% fat. So it's an incredibly fat animal. Okay, so just a bit of a caveat on that. Uh, merinos are a bit of a special case. Merinos actually eat quite well. If anything, just slightly better than, than standard terminal cross sire lambs. But they do have a higher stress response and they have a higher loss of muscle glycogen. Therefore, they have a higher chance of high pH meat. And so it's very important to have lambs finishing strongly, particularly if they're merinos. Uh, and one way to help these animals be more stress tolerant is to increase the muscle breeding value. But that's another topic, and of course, under sheep genetics and merino select. So in summary, the producer requirements under MSA are summarized in this slide. There are producer standards, minimum two weeks off shears. You, know, you don't want to bear Sean and get frozen to death in a rain shower or something. Fat score greater than six mil, which, is, which means score two or above. 18 kilos of uh, carcass weight. Time off feed, not greater than 48 hours from curfew to, uh, to, uh, to kill. Uh, or, or stun, so that's two days. That'll help stop the leak of glycogen and minimum of two weeks on the consignment property before dispatch. So in other words, those lambs are contented on the property where they're being finished. Now there are producer recommendations also, and these relate to growth rate and those growth rates help fill the glycogen bucket. You'll notice 100 grams for uh, terminal cross and maternal cross animals, but it's 150 grams per day for merinos. This is largely because merinos just need a bit more oomph into the nutrition side of the glycogen bucket to make sure they're full. Now that diagram there, you can peruse that. That's just another diagrammatic interpretation of what I've described, but it also uh, describes what the processors and retailers must do, but we won't discuss that today. That diagram might be useful for your further uh, understanding. Now a little bit about where we're heading for in, in MSA into the future. Um, we, we are heading down the path of carcass grading more strongly. So at the moment, carcass grading is simply carcass weight and what is called a palpated fat score. So it's an approximation of the fat score. The first point is that intramuscular fat is positive for eating quality, or as we say, it's called marbling in beef. And the second unfortunate thing is that lean meat yield or the percent of meat in the carcass uh, is negative. So in other words, heavily muscled animals is a negativity for eating quality. So there's the graph that shows the response between intramuscular fat in the meat of the loin and the consumer score, whether it be tenderness, overall liking, flavor and juiciness, they all respond strongly to increase the consumer score. So it's very clear uh, data and similar to beef. The next one is that there's a, a negative interaction between the lean meat yield, in this case, breeding value on the bottom axis and on the side axis of the intramuscular fat breeding value. So there's a negative relationship, which is just a bit of, bit of a graphic information to explain what I said. So the two are negatively related and need management into the future. And in fact, single focus selection on lean meat yield will reduce eating quality. And we've already seen a trend for this in terminal size, but to the credit of the terminal side breeders, they are rapidly turning this around because they have new breeding values for these two traits that they can now manipulate. Again, that's a, that's a story for uh, sheep genetics in the future. So the, what we're doing is developing a new Mark II MSA model. So this Mark II MSA model will have predictors measured at the abattoir. As well, you'll still have the other rules and regulations, if you like, uh, or, or recommendations associated with the current MSA system. But at the abattoir, we'll measure lean meat yield. At the abattoir, we'll measure the level of intramuscular fat. Of course, we can measure hot carcass weight. And we'll have a sire type, the sire type being merino, maternal, maternal meaning in this particular case, mainly border lester, but other maternals, and also terminal. By terminal, of course, I mean, you know, dorsal, pole dorsal, and the like. So this is based on over 2,000 lambs that have been eaten, 7,000 consumers. So it's a lot of data behind this. So we, we now have rolling out right now, I'm sure many of you understand this, there's this X-ray driven precision cutting in, in lamb abattoirs. It's very spectacular where the X-rays find the ribs and it drives saws to give you precision cutting to get the maximum amount of meat in the rack area, which is worth more than say the forequarter area. We've now 
turn that into a dual energy X-ray uh, system that can accurately measure lean meat yield with very, very high precision. So we have the technology now to measure lean meat yield or the, you know, the grams of meat or the kilograms of meat in the carcass with high precision. The next thing we need is to measure intramuscular fat, which is actually quite difficult. So at the moment, the front runner is, a, is camera technology, very modern camera technology uh, with many different wavelengths. It takes about seven different uh, wavelength pictures of, of one loin. And this is looking very promising for estimating the level of intramuscular fat in the loin and therefore other muscles of the carcass. So that's where we're up to there. Then we join this together with a prediction equation. So then you can estimate the eating quality grade. So we have sire type by intramuscular fat by lean meat yield. We can then predict the eating quality of the cuts. So in the case of the lamb loin, the lamb short loin, the data that we have at the moment, which is, uh, I must admit, quite wide ranging. Um, so it may not represent a defined tight abattoir spec. So I'm sure we can improve on this. But basically 7% of the lamb loins are ungrade or unsatisfactory, 34% are good every day or good, 35% are better than every day or better, and 24% are premium. Now, considering you're paying 44 bucks a kilo for a lamb loin, I think most people would argue that you really want your lamb loin to be better or best, that is better than every day or premium. So what's likely to happen and what's happened in beef is that carcass grading and MSA Mark II will underpin lamb brands who wish to benchmark or underpin their product at, de at a desired quality. So some people might say, well, we'll just, we'll just benchmark our lamb to be good or good every day or better, that's fine. Other people might say, no, I want my particular top end brand to be better than every day or above. So this is what's happening in the beef industry and we predict this could well happen in the lamb industry. So there's no, no need to panic, I don't think, but it will allow the, the elite brands to, to develop further but you'll still be able to have most of our land getting that good every day and only 7% on grade based on that. Um, now, to, now to conclude, I think we're almost running on time, 26 minutes according to me. Uh, just give you a very brief update of, of the MSA uh, sheep uh, system. It's the 20th anniversary, by the way, of beef MSA. And I actually feel very guilty. I can't precisely remember uh, when, the, when the land MSA started soon after. So approximately 25% of the national slaughter is following MSA pathways, is MSA graded. So that's about half of the domestic kill, uh, because at the moment we've really only focused on the domestic side of the, of the equation. So but the, there's now a new trend to focus in on the overseas markets as well. And of those uh, lambs, uh, we're up to now in 2015-16, 63% of those lambs are what we call trademarked. So they're actually sold like with an MSA sticker on the bag or in the, on the box. Uh, so, that, so MSA flows through to the wholesaler uh, um, to, to underpin those brands. So uh, that's very encouraging um, uh, support for the MSA system from the industry players, which of course is our processors and retailers. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I think we, uh, I'll just go through our, our, uh, our, our dot points. Um, Lamb still rates behind beef and chicken in the consumer views, but I think it's more uh, a price issue uh, because they're paying a lot of money per, per kilo for, for, our, for our lamb, which of course we're very happy for. Um, and I'm very, you know, I'm actually quite so happy that we've held that eight kilos of consumption in, in Australia, given the price increase. I think that's a credit to the MSA system that we've taken a lot of the variation out of lamb already. Um, the conclusion is, however, given the price, we still need to always work on quality because it's, it's actually dollars per, per the consumer experience that you really want. Uh, the prospects for, for, for global demand are very strong and uh, sure, I'll put, I, I can't tell you what the price of land will be tomorrow, but every, every uh, futuristic person, uh, they never bag lamb, I can assure you. MSA lamb is based on extensive consumer testing, just like beef, for the real people give real answers. Lamb is better than hogget or yearling. I know a lot of people think, uh, you know, and I'm, uh, but it's actually always better in the consumer eyes, particularly in the leg cuts. But clearly, hogget or yearling, two or four tooth, young, young, young mutton or whatever you want to call them, are clearly a potentially marketable item, no question. 
Finish is, is very important for intramuscular fat, glycogen, and meat pH. Lean meat yield is negative on lamb eating quality, and this will become a factor in the future. Uh, new trends in carcass grading will see the development of, of MSA Mark II, which is grading for lean meat yield and intramuscular fat. And I can tell you now, genetics will play an increasing role in the, in the future of, of, of lamb eating quality. 50% of the variation in intramuscular fat, for example, is due to genetics. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's it for me. The last page is an important page. If you're not a registered MSA sheep meat uh, person, this page shows you very clearly how to become such. Uh, many, of course, one part of the MSA system is you must be a registered producer. And also you'll find at the very bottom there, there'll be a link to a complete MSA sheep meat information kit, which is a very extensive and very impressive document. So David, thanks very much. Over to you and, and back to the audience. And hopefully I didn't speak too fast and people were able to understand at least part of what I was talking about. Hmm. No, definitely. Thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate that. It was a, a great presentation, very concise and uh, very well timed in, in, in reflection. Um, uh, no doubt the audience picked up a lot uh, from a, pr a very broad sort of um, uh, a broad presentation this evening on the technical technical aspects of of keeping um, keeping the eating or you know management on farm and, and genetics of keeping the eating quality of lamb up and also some of the uh, broad industry issues surrounding sheep meat eating quality. Now, just uh, for the audience the this evening, don't forget that we're having another webinar next week, and that's going to be focused on um, prime lamb benchmarks, and that's going to be information flowing out of the 2017 home circuit benchmarking process. Now, we'll be getting insights into what the best producers have been doing and what sort of profitability and production they are achieving and some of the systems and techniques, management ideas that they've uh, been implementing to uh, to be able to um, meet those uh, those top 20% performance bands. Now, at the end of this webinar this evening, don't forget there's going to be a survey pop-up. Please participate in the survey. It's very important for myself and for Professor Dave Pethick to uh, review our feedback to make sure that we're delivering good value to the industry and also for MLA to help them better invest in um, where they uh, better invest in the extension activities across uh, across the uh, across the country now this is your opportunity to uh, ask Dave as many questions as you'd like there's a few questions rolling in there I encourage everyone to put their fingers to the keyboard and, and push a few more questions our way Dave's a great source of knowledge and as you can see has been there since the inception of the MSA program 20 years ago and has a wealth of knowledge in, in this area and uh, in animal animal science and uh, nutrition and eating quality in general so it's your opportunity to uh, ask the tricky questions and we'll do our best to answer them so with that Dave as the uh, presenter do you mind if I take the liberty of asking the first question Oh, no, no problem. Please do. Dave, when, with the intramuscular fat, um, mm -hmm. is sometimes when you cook chops, uh, they, you know, I'll, I've had a few instances where my barbecues turn into a, an inferno. Um, is the, is, does the intramuscular fat, is that what gives, you know, sometimes they talk of dorper meat or damra meat to be very mm -hmm. greasy and to, you know, is that... That's very, it's, it's, I'm with you. So, so of course, all the product, ne nearly all the product we we run past consumers is what I call heavily denuded. So, um, the uh, you know, we, we'll feed them uh, French cutlets, but they'll be they'll be they'll be um, they'll be Frenched. Yeah, you know, a Frenching means taking all the subcutaneous fat off. So, um, we have. Uh, done some work with uh, roasting lamb, roasting racks cap on and cap off. So that means the fat cap is left on, and of course you end up with fat all over the place, spitting everywhere and whatever else. Or you actually denude, you know, like a French rack, completely denuded. And the consumers, uh, at, uh, but each time the consumers served the lean meat out of that. So a lot of people say you should cook with the fat on the outside fat on I'm talking about, the subcutaneous fat, well, it makes no damn difference. You can cook it denuded. 
So once you start cooking your chops more heavily trimmed or lean, say, rump steaks or, or French cutlets, one, your barbecue won't blow up because you've taken all that subcutaneous fat off, which is where all the, most of the fat is. And then you're left with intramuscular fat, which, of course, is now the average is 4.2%. So it's quite low, to be honest. So uh, that's how we do it. And that's when you get that positive response to IMF. So the modern consumer, I think the last MLA statistic I saw is somewhere between was about 80% of, between 80 and 90% now, I think, of consumers trim external fat either before or after cooking. So in other most people trim external fat. So most people now just eat the lean with all the, you know, medical stuff that's been going on. So has that helped answer that? Yeah, thank you, David. No, it's perfect. Um, that's very interesting about cooking the uh, cooking the roast with the, the the cap on or off. Um, I know uh, it makes no difference. At least when you can consumer test it. Yep. <laughs> I can save I can save the grease trap in my oven now. Um, yeah, I think you can. That's right. <laughs> I've got a question here. I don't know whether anybody's ever cooked a score five four quarter. But you roast a score five four quarter in a, in, a, in a pan in the Weber or something. You're hopefully doing the Weber outside. And then you you know you serve the four quarter and you're still fat every. Then you look next morning the amount of fat that's left in your pan, it's probably a half a centimetre. Sorry, a centimetre deep. Yeah, yeah. Solid, you know, <laughs> after a cold night. Sorry, you know, I'm digressing. <laughs> that's okay. We've got a question here from uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry asks a, a good question. Um, Dave, do you know uh, where goat meat sits on the global meat consumption scale? I should do, uh, and I think it's the most commonly eaten meat in the world or something, isn't it? That seems to ring a bell. Uh, so goat meat's quite important, uh, and of course there's a good market for goat meat these days, and I believe goat carcasses you know, uh, go at a very handy price now. But sorry, I can't give you any more detailed information about goat meat. We've never consumer-tested goat meat. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you any more information. No worries, no worries at all. Um, a question here from Rodney. Uh, Dave, recently in the uh, MLA Feedback magazine, it was quoted that there was a 13% increase in global sheep meat consumption per capita from 1996 to 2015. Much, and it, uh, you know, it, and it stated that this was much better than beef, which actually had a decrease over the same time period. Uh, does that actually fit in with the charts that you showed this evening from what Rodney? Yeah, Rodney, let's have a look here. So the chart of the percent share of the meat is the, I've gone back to that graph. I don't know if the people can send, I'll, yep. I'll get back to that graph. The percent share, what was it? What was the date again between 20? Uh, 96 to 15, 2015. 1996. Yep. 2015 but it looks to me like the share went down until about 2011 and then the shares started to come up again so i don't know yeah like i'm sorry i i, I don't you know i've got to multiply it by percent and kilos it's a bit it's a bit hard 96 the number of yeah the number of kilos and that looks like that little the little black bars at the top are the actual kilograms of land yeah yep in that slide and if you go to 2015, those little black bars are considerably bigger in 2015 than they are in 1996. So I think we'll have to agree that's the actual kilograms because the percent is a bit tricky because you've got the other meats increasing as well. Do you understand? Yeah, so that black bar is substantially bigger. I know it's – I can't give you a quantitative number, that's all. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'd have to agree based on that, on, on that graph. That graph would agree with that. Perfect. Right yeah. and that graph says that the lamb consumption per, per in the world uh, will actually keep just gradually increasing. It won't be huge. It'll you know it'll still only be five percent of the meat, but it'll be five percent of a bigger share than it is now. Awesome. No worries. Well, uh, there's a question here that's coming from uh, William. Uh, William asks of you, how important is uh, cooking skill in the eating quality of lamb? Right, look, I'm sure I'm sure it is important. I mean, um, 
obviously the main one is roast and and and, uh, and shops is the main thing and it's unfortunate uh, lamb mince is not a major item so of course 60 percent of beef is sold and cooked as mince so that probably helps uh, cooking uh, skills if you know what i mean so i guess it's important we do know that um the degree of doneness is not quite as important as what people think so um i can tell you that much but of course we we serve um when we sell, serve grilled lamb, we serve it with a, a Silex grill. This thing's worth about twenty thousand dollars, so it's computer it's computer run, and we we cook it to an internal temperature of seventy every single time. So, of course, cooking skills are important, but um, I think it's pretty clear from the beef work where there's been more of it done that the innate quality of the product initially is is probably still more important. Okay, no, perfect. Thank you, Dave. Um, Dave, there's a question, uh, another good question here. Well, it's a question slash comment, but I think mm -hmm. you'd be able to weigh in here. Mm -hmm. Chris, uh, Chris says, Dave, great to see MSA's work on eating quality. <clears throat> Can I suggest that a, a negative towards lamb from the consumer's end, uh, including uh, me, including Chris, is the poor range mm -hmm. of cuts in most outlets. He, Chris suggests it's just chops, 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 and then roasts, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't disagree, Chris. It's, it's something we're working on uh, strongly. I mean, lamb, if it's, you know, the, the original trim lamb work uh, where you bring out rounds and rumps and, uh, and uh, French cutlets and, uh, easy carve roast, easy carve four quarters. There, there are as a lamb can really be presented well, but the, you know, and some supermarkets are starting to come on board. There's no doubt about it. It's not privy that I should say which ones, but you can go go to them yourself and have a look. There's some terrific new cuts around. There's, there's a one of the supermarkets is delivering a um, the hill muscle, which is the top of the shank. Uh, in a little backpack, 500 gram box, and it's the most exquisite cut for um, doing a curry or a slow cook. It's like a bit like alsobuco, if you like, if you like. But the the it, it's changing. But generally speaking, they always argue putting a knife into a lamb costs a lot of money. So so there's a great tendency to, to want to get a lamb carcass, chop the leg off, and sell it because it's one bandsaw cut, well, not quite one, but you understand the, the less cutting. So as robotics are coming in, uh, those X-ray cutters I talked about are coming in, the opportunity for more fabrication of lamb is getting better, uh, more cost effective, and this will allow more cuts to come forth. So I'm agreeing with you, Chris, but I think we'll get there. Perfect. That's it. Sorry, Dave. I, I can't answer any better. Uh, probably not very good, but I've done my best. No, that's fine. No, thank you very much, David. Um, I've I might uh, ask a quick question myself, Dave, if mm -hmm. I may. Now, we talked about uh, genetics uh, going to play a pretty strong, a, a large role in mm -hmm. maintaining and improving sheep meat eating quality into the future. Now, mm -hmm. um, genetics uh, with the IMF. And LMF, or intramuscular fat and lean meat yield. Yep. Now there's a um, there's a negative correlation. So is is which which of the two uh, traits would be closer related to lamb growth rate? Would it be lean meat yield or would it be? Well, lean meat yield is, is the amount of muscle and the amount of fat really you know so lean meat the lean meat yield is the lean meat the amount of muscle you can pull off a carcass and uh, and, uh, and the other bit is fat and the other bit is bone so they are your three components if you like so lean meat yield is determined by fatness one and two muscling so they're both two attributes that, that determine the final value for lean meat yield so the fat of the animal the lower the lean meat yield and the, and the lower the muscle score of the animal the the lower the lean meat yield there's two mm. factors so i suppose as a, a, a so a commercial producer is faced with a with a quandary to some extent with regards to um if they're pursuing a growth rate which is and mm. uh which is uh obviously a, a trait that will uh, improve the or you know contribute to the profitability of their prime lamb enterprise sure. they could be they could be 
um, antagonizing with uh, intramuscular fat. Um, yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's, there's, the genetics is sort of a bigger, quite a big topic, but there's three levers in genetics. There's the uh, the weaning weight breeding belly. There's a weaning weight and a post weaning weight breeding belly, and they they, they are the main drivers of growth rate. So that's really the, 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 those numbers uh, really represent like a mature size type breeding value in some ways by, by correlation. But the other things that drive your growth rate, and that post weaning weight or weaning weight breeding value doesn't actually bugger up eating quality at all. Um, it just means they reach the desired carcass weight quicker, assuming they're under, under good nutrition. So you know they'll get to 24 kilos, whatever it is, quicker. Uh, it's the fat breeding valley and the muscle breeding valley. So there's the PFAT, it's the fat breeding valley, uh, and the PEMD or, or, or post eye muscle depth breeding valley. They're the two uh, that can influence um, eating quality along with uh, intramuscular fat. So high growth animals should be okay, to be frank. Okay. As long as they kill the high fat score. Yep, right. Yeah, so, yep. Okay. Um, now, as, uh, I'll just continue with the audience questions here. So there's a good question here that's come in from Justin. Uh, mm -hmm. Justin's asked, um, Dave, can you give an indication of uh, eating quality between young or old lambs? So we've already been across this to a certain extent. You might yeah, we have. Up. And, and he's, got, Justin. he's got another yep, question out there, but I'll let you deal with that one first, and then Justin's got it. Yeah, to be frank, Justin, we, we put a lot of effort into, uh, what can I say, 12 months, 13 months, 14 months, 15 months, around that dentition change area, because that's where industry wanted us to invest, uh, and uh, they're making decisions on that data now. So we've done not so much comparison between, if you like, say, a, a, a milk lamb or, or, or a sucker lamb, five months old, versus, let's say, a, a 11, 12 months old lamb. So we're just investing to do some of that work now. Actually, in separate experiments, when you look at the, we've killed a few young ones, and of course we've killed plenty of old ones. The difference doesn't look that big, but that's just a bit of a guess at the moment. So I, I just that I can't answer that clearly at the moment, but hopefully in about 12 months time, we'll have a clear answer for it because it's been, it's come up as a clear question to be answered. I would hope, I'd love it if there's no difference but of course the data will be the data. Perfect, thank you Dave, that's really good. Um, uh, now there's a question here from Andrew. Um, Andrew asks, or he leads with a statement, celebrity chefs talk about caramelization when they, when talking about flavor of meat. Is this related to the higher glycogen content above that required to control pH? Would this higher glycogen content be a factor in the higher flavour of wild, killed, or game meat? That's an interesting question, Andrew, and, and um, I don't know that there's a clear answer to that. It's often called residual glycogen. The, the amount of sugar that's actually left over in the meat after only so much lactic acid can be formed, and then the cell gets pickled by the acid, so nothing else, you know, stops working. So there's actually sugar left over it might be about 0.5% sugar. So it's fairly low, but yeah, there's still, the jury's out on what contribution that makes to flavor. I think typically caramelization is, uh, is it's called the Maillard reaction. And it's, it's the natural, natural uh, fats and carbohydrates and proteins and on the surface of the meat and any extra sugar you add to give you that, um, those flavors at the surface of the cooking area is where it is. So yeah, the, the jury's out on, on the role of glycogen itself in the Maillard reaction. But my guess is it probably plays a role. I, I agree with you, Andrew, it probably plays a role. Like I, I didn't mention it, but horse meat has about twice the level of glycogen as sheep and cattle meat because horses are selected for athletic uh, excellence, whether they be draft horses or whatever, they're all pretty good athletes. And uh, that increases their glycogen levels. They, they're, their natural high levels about 4%. So, and some people argue that that gives them a special flavour. Now, look, I'm not attributing we, we start raising horses for eating, and I don't eat horses either. But uh, I thought you'd like that as just a, a bit of a bit of a throwaway. <laughs> no worries, that's perfect, Dave. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I've got a quick question, Dave, if I may. Now, when I was uh, studying meat science at, at, at university, I um, mm-hmm. described a, a scenario in pigs. It's, I think they called it PSE. Are you familiar, oh, yeah, the two, yeah. are you familiar yeah. with that? Yeah, well, I'm very familiar with that. So pigs, of course, are quite a different animal to, to sheep or cattle, uh, and sheep and cattle are far more similar. So PSE is when uh, that formation of lactic acid happens incredibly quickly. So the glycogen almost explodes into a lactic acid while the carcass is still hot because pigs have what we call white muscle fibres, just like chickens. So pig meat's quite light coloured now. It's white fibres. And white fibres are biochemically very active. And so they explode almost biochemically after death and form this very rapid formation of lactic acid, which cooks the meat and busts the cells up and the water drips everywhere. So PSE, or pale soft exudative pork, is exactly that when you have this extremely rapid formation of acid in the meat post-slaughter. Now, essentially, um, lamb just doesn't get it. You know, the lamb carcass is uh, com- composed of red muscle fibres, which metabolise more slowly because they're designed for a lamb can walk, you know, many kilometres, like, like a sheep can and a beast can. So, yeah, that's a special thing for uh, for pork. To the pork industry's credit, they also have a genetic component and they've nearly eliminated the genes that's, uh, that, that, that um, cause that. Plus, pork now also use CO2 stunning, uh, which means that the uh, animal is very gently put to sleep uh, rather than the old brutal method of head stunning, uh, electrical head stunning pork, which is pretty brutal. Okay, well, thank you. That uh, that uh, clears that up for me. And, um, yeah, pretty interesting. I have experienced the uh, few pork chops in the uh, pan that seem to go to water and then cardboard after that. So interesting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's him. Now, I've done a great job. <laughs> Now, there's a question here from Patrick. Uh, Patrick mm-hmm. asks, uh, Dave, is there any eating quality data comparing lambs sold in the sale yards versus lambs sold via direct consignment to the abattoir? Yeah, so the, 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 there is. There's, uh, it, if, you can, um, if you can make sure they're not too stressed out, so if, there's, if the pH isn't influenced or if you like muscle glycogen is looked after so the, the lambs aren't going through sale yards for days on end and things like that uh, the uh, the eating quality differential is not so big and in fact there are there are pathway methods for sale yards I, I mean personally I don't uh, condone sale yards selling a, sla- a slaughter stock of course store stock I do uh, I prefer to see animals go direct consignment it's one of the key things particularly about excessive water deprivation and excessive feed deprivation in lamb is that the lamb carcass weight declines by 0.1% per hour after 12 hours of feed. 0.1% per hour. Now you work that out. That's a huge loss in, in, in um, carcass weight uh, to the processor if they buy it through the sale yards or if, if, you're, if you're selling direct. So, yeah, look, look, Patrick, not a huge effect. Uh, obviously, it increases the risk of stress-related events and extended fasting-related events to, to, to reduce muscle sugar. That's probably the biggest problem. So the key thing, if you can get them farm to sticking uh, in the 48 hours through a part, sale yard pathway, they're approved. But, of course, they've got to, you've got to be pretty slick to, to do that. Perfect. I think that's it, Dave, for the sale yard story. Yep, thank you very much. No, that's perfect. Now, a uh, question here from Kevin. Kevin, he's, uh, he manages a, a large prime lamb flock out to the east of Wagga Wagga uh, to put you in the picture okay. today. And, um, we need more of you, Kevin, I'll tell you. We need more of you, mate. <laughs> I know he's a very good operator and, and a, strong, a strong supporter of the webinars too. So good evening, Kevin. Good question. Uh, Kevin Kevin asks, is there any evidence that older woolly lambs, say six months of age, have dark cutting meat when compared to shorn lambs? Uh, well, we, we know that you know, the, the, the first couple of weeks off shears, the, 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 uh, the lamb is, is susceptible to weather changes, whether it be extreme heat or to be extreme cold, to be frank, because, of course, the wool uh, 
uh, insulates the lamb from heat, and of course it insulates you know, the lamb from cold, to say the obvious. So the answer is yes, uh, we've got some papers on the effects of shearing and um, it certainly alters the pH, of the, of the, of the, oh, sorry, increases the chance of the, of the pH going up or the glycogen going down. So that's why we put the caveat that you should at least be two weeks off shears. Of course, if you want to maximise your skin value, well, you want to orientate your wool to be somewhere around about that one inch or 2.5 centimetres, to, you know, around that 2.5 to 3 centimetres of length. Uh, that gives you the optimal skin for making, um, you know, uh, woolons, sheepskin garments uh, or, or covers or whatever it is. So, of course, you, 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 you want to be optimising your wool length to, uh, to increase the value of your skins. I know skin values go up and down, but uh, assuming they're, they're worth something. No, it's interesting, Dave. So Kevin's Kevin's question was actually inferring that uh, there was um, the woolly lambs had higher incidence right. of cutting. So what you're actually saying, okay. the short shawnies or short, fresh off shears, they're actually at a higher. Uh, they're they're the ones that are at a higher risk of dark cutting. If they really, I'm talking, I'm talking about dead straight off dead straight off shearing, you know. So there's no no cover at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see where Kevin's coming from. If if, if you've got an animal that's in full wool. And you exercise them on a hot day, you'll blow them up because sheep are interesting physiologically. Sheep can't sweat, so they can only pan. So if, you, if, you've, if you've got a, a big uh, insulator, a, a long wool around them, they can't lose any radiant heat through their body. So they can only lose heat by panting. So all the heat's got to come out with their breath. So anybody who, I remember as a kid, if you've got some old, old girls on a hot day and you're walking them, every now and again, some of those old girls just sit down. They, they just won't move, they just sit down. Bang, can't touch them. We can touch them, they won't go anywhere. Then you'll come back in 10 minutes time when they've recovered them, they're off like a, off like a light again. So sheep actually are quite susceptible to, to getting quite hot when they've got wool on, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're flogging them around. You know, in, other, in other words, mustering them. So Kevin might have a point. I'm sure he's got a point. Yep, for sure. So just got to be careful of that internally generated yeah. when they're when they're when they're. I think so. That's, um, that's probably, I think that might be what Kevin's alluding to, and he's dead right. Okay. Now, a question here from Brad. Um, I I don't actually I can't actually interpret the question, but I will ask you, Dave. And if we need more information, I'll get I'll get Brad to get back to us. But uh, yeah. is, Dave, any proof of a generate additive being a plus for eating quality? Are you familiar? Oh, okay. So there, there are. Uh, there's been quite a lot of work on, you know, electrolytes uh, being added to water. Is that what we're talking about? I think that's what we're talking about. I th I'm not electrolytes, people added glycerol. You know, you've added sugar and all sorts of stuff to water to see whether um, you can get something in, in an electrolyte manner, a bit like for athletes, or a bit of energy into them through the water. And to be to be honest, uh, most of them have proven to be uh, absolutely marginal at best. You just can't really get enough uh, substance of anything into an animal via the water in a short period of time. Okay, right, yeah. So that's that's where the research research sits. That's the long and short of it. Uh, I mean, there's there's one. There's a little bit of work in, uh, like merinos are more stress susceptible. There's a little bit of work that, you know, increasing the magnesium levels in the diet of a merino, and this would be possible, you know, more sort of like a feedlot environment. You can use feed grade, make fine grind magnesium oxide at about 0.5%. There's some evidence that that helps calm the animals and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, there's some clear evidence that it helps muscle glycogen and meat pH. Uh, and there's no doubt that uh, magnesium is used uh, in, in humans and, and uh, in, um, in uh, horses uh, and, and even in pigs as a muscle relaxant. So there's a little bit of evidence about magnesium, but it's got to be really added into the diet to get enough into the animal. Very hard to get enough of anything via the water. So, David, would it be safe to infer that um, by, you know, any uh, terminal... Uh, ram stud selected yeah. for temperament would be indirectly yeah. um, assisting the uh, eating quality of of the ram's offspring just through lowering the stress of the of the animal. Oh, I'd say so. We've not worked. You know, there's not there's not too many commercial measures of, of temperament um, in, in the sheep genetic system, but in beef where they are, there's a lot of work around the world that says temperament is a positive outcome for uh, for meat science. Yeah, no, no no question about it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, 
Uh, last question for the evening at, at the moment, Dave. It comes from William. So mm -hmm. if anybody else has got more questions out there, um, while Dave's still online, jump jump on and ask. Otherwise, um, this will be our last. Uh, William asks, if no was, we've already alluded to it, but has there been any studies uh, looking into specific breeds versus eating quality? So, <clears throat> of course, we've looked at uh, a number of breeds, uh, Merinos, uh, We've looked at, uh, we've got, you know, Suffolk size in the system. We've got white Suffolk's. We've got pole Dorsets. There's a few Texels. Uh, there's in meat Merinos, you know. Uh, uh, there's there's all, sorts of, all sorts in there. And really, uh, the moral of the story, like any, particularly from a genetics point of view, there's always as much variation uh, within a breed as there is between breeds. So, for instance, the first couple of hundred sides we looked at, I haven't benchmarked the others, where we actually had a, an estimate of the of the actual eating quality breeding value of the animal. It was an, you know, it's, it's, it's a research work and it's not for mainstream commercial use. Number one animal was a merino out of 200. But number, uh, I think it was a number 180 was a merino as well. You know, number seven was a white Suffolk, and but you know, number 182 was a white Suffolk. Just to give you an example of the the breeds, you know, really scattered through the whole range. So that's why we've gone down to these more specific breeding values. Uh, ideally, in the end, a genomic breeding value for actual eating quality will come forth, but that might take a few more years. Okay, well, perfect, Dave. Thank you. So, yeah, so breed. Thank you, everybody. Oh, well, actually, Dave, there's been a few more questions come through. Yep. Um, oh, gee whiz. Yep, yep. They've, they've had a second wind. Um, would you, I'm just yep. thinking, Dave, would you mind um, just flicking your slides forward towards uh, oh, yeah, sure. or back maybe to that, you know, where they, they can have a look at uh, where. Oh, yeah, the MSA sign up. Sorry, I, I apologise. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I think that'll be good. Uh, any detail there they need to take. There, that one there. Yep. Sorry about that. Should have, should have got straight back there. Um, yep. Now there's a quick question here, or well, there's two questions that have come through. One from Justin, um, or Casey. Mm -hmm. Casey, uh, thank you very much for the uh, webinar. Casey's been a, a long-time supporter of the webinars. Good to see you, and um, she thanks you. No doubt she'll be off to uh, Thanks, Casey. to attend to the rest of her evening. Um, Justin asks. Yeah, it's getting, late, getting late for you lot over there. It's almost getting beer time for me, but it's late for you fellas. Yeah, and ladies. Yeah, we're we're we're, uh, we're looking very impressive. Hang in there. Well done. No, no, they're they're well they're well trained. This audience, they've um, they've <laughs> we've, 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 we've we've strung them out. Uh, we've almost uh, quarter to ten at night, so everyone. Uh, oh, my gosh, it's late. Yes. Yeah, but no. Justin asks, uh, water usage mm -hmm. per kilogram of meat um, seems misinformed in the community. Oh, it's rubbish. Oh, it's rubbish. I can't stand that debate. Oh, it's rubbish. I mean, they assume that every bit of water that falls on a pasture goes through the bloody sheep. It's just, oh, sorry, you, you've got me going now. I'm starting to swear, so I better, no, better settle okay. down. But, uh, you might have to. No, this, uh, I'm, I'm with you, Justin. It totally annoys me. It's not my field. I haven't worked on it, but the claims and the commentary is just absolutely ridiculous. I, it just thoroughly annoys me. It's misinformed by, you know, certain people who want to just manipulate the numbers. But that's that's how they calculate those ridiculous numbers, that you've got a farm and all your, you know, whatever it is, uh, 500 mil of rain falls on the property and they, they assume it all, uh, that, that all of that rain is needed to produce a kilo of sheep meat. Like the rain fell anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Justin, you got me going. No I'll worries. Stop. <laughs> well, we'll, um, I think we, we agree with each other. Um, um, there's a good, a good question here. Um, let me just get to get the whole question on my screen before I, before I ask it of you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Colin. Colin's a prime land producer. Down, uh, down towards Holbrook, and um, he's, he's very involved in in, the, in his prime lambs down there. Now, Colin asks, is the higher IMF intramuscular fat the mm -hmm. silver bullet for increasing lamb eating quality, similar to the Wagyu experience? Well, it's not the silver bullet so much. It's it's going to make a contribution to it, uh, and you know the, the 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 outcome is a combination of of uh, at the moment sire type. Uh, lean meat yield and IMF, so all those things interact to give you the outcome. So it's one factor. I wouldn't say it's a silver bullet, but it's an important factor. It's got a high genetic uh, component, so therefore it's something we can manage and deal with. So yeah, I, I, I still think um, uh, until we get a, a breeding value for the actual EQ, the true prediction, 
which would be nice. Uh, IMS going to be very important, but to call it a silver bullet, no, because we're not going anywhere near a Japanese black or wagyu product. So a pure, a pure Japanese black animal or wagyu animal uh, with any decent gen genetic merit, when it's fully finished out to a pretty heavy carcass, they'll have a, a, an intramuscular fat content, probably at least 25% of the meat will be fat. So we're talking, what was I talking? I was saying 5%, wasn't I? It was, would be ideal for a, for a, um, a high-end product. And you know, typically in, how can I say, more normal domestic beef, about 5% intramuscular fat, along with them being younger and don't use hormones and whatever else, will give you, um, you know, high quality four-star stuff. So the, the, the amount of intramuscular fat we're talking is, is a country mile away from Japanese black or wagyu cattle. Okay, no, perfect. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Dave, Justin just had one, one more part of a of his water. <laughs> yeah, no, no more water. He's um, um. Now this question here is: Are there different genetic fat types, uh, i.e., dry fat, for eating quality? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So, so like fat is a, is a complex um, tissue. Uh, there's many different types of fat in it, you know, the omega-3s, omega-6s and all these fancy words that people use. Um, you know, I guess w w we can't find strong causative uh, effects of, the, of uh, different types of fat within muscle and the eating quality experience. It just seems to be more the total fat. So we, our statistical interpretations can't come up with any particular subset of fat that's more important than another. But one real positive thing on lamb is that the average value for lamb across a 24 month season for the omega-3 fats is actually very, very good. And it could be classified as a source of omega-3 from a human nutritional point of view. So the omega-3 story is actually very positive in lamb, even just on average, because of course, sometimes it's grass finished. If you're from Western Australia, it's uh, at the moment, of course, grain finished because our paddocks haven't got any green. Uh, but in the winter, it's grass finished, you know, so, so, so uh, the lamb fat story, uh, the intramuscular fat story is actually quite a positive one. And we're trying to write a paper on that so as we can publish it in an American dietetics journal because the dietitians themselves aren't aware of this. So there you go. So I'm, 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 I'm uh, on a few fronts trying to keep lamb in, in the face of the consumer. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dave. And that was uh, the, no that was the last question for the evening. And um, I really appreciate the audience, uh, David, for uh, for asking those questions and showing um, such strong in interest. In it. And uh, yeah, really, thank you very much to all of you. No worries at all. And um, and um, no doubt, it's uh, the audience uh, has uh, has enjoyed tonight's webinar. Quite they they have. Uh, it's very limited opportunity for them to provide you the feedback. It, it's sometimes a little bit of a thankless task providing a webinar, but I can no mm -hmm. doubt uh, inform you that um, everyone who does attend the webinars and and if they get uh, good practical and frank discussions uh, coming from the presenter, they always appreciate it. So, so take it from from me on behalf of the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, David, and thank you, audience. Cheerio, all the best. Keep producing those lambs. <laughs> will do. Thank you, David. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that, will, that, that wraps up the, the webinar this evening. Thank you very much to David for providing such a good, concise and, and easy listening webinar. Um, we look forward to uh, hearing more about the MSA program and any updates on the lamb eating quality that may be pertinent to the industry as a whole as we progress. Don't forget that next week we'll be holding a prime lamb Benchmarks uh, production and financial benchmarks webinar that's going to be delivered by Home Sackett, and we'll be looking at some, what are the best prime land producers doing with regards to profitability and pro productivity, and what are some of the systems and management techniques they implement to achieve these top 20% uh, performance. Don't forget, after the webinar shuts this evening, there's going to be a survey pop up on your screen. Please participate in the survey, it should only take you a few minutes. We take the, info, the feedback seriously and helps drive decision making uh, around MLA's extension into the future. Thank you on behalf of MLA and on behalf of David for attending this evening's webinar and we look forward to having you on board at future sessions. Good evening.